So first, uh, happy birthday, Thibaut. Um, so for me, it feels a bit like a, a time travel into the past to be here. And uh, I really remember my time here as being very formative. So I think of IHS as a luxury place for research where the clock seemed to be stopped to leave the time uh, to think. But it was also a pretty um, stressful time for me to be surrounded by so many uh, bright minds. And I still remember uh, our discussion at uh, lunches where you would ask me uh, uh, about my progresses and the question that you had asked me at the previous lunch. And <laughs> so then there was a discussion at the table where there were always pen and paper. Uh, and I could even find back traces of those discussions. And I must say it was not always trivial to converse th those notes and those drawings into a mathematical equation. Anyway, so, so you know that uh, since then I have uh, changed research field, but in my mind I didn't really change paths because instead of addressing fundamental questions about uh, uh, space like singularities and the origin of the universe, I'm addressing now a question about living systems. And I'm particularly interested by embryonic development and the role of the geometrical arrangement of the cells uh, in the embryo to, uh, uh, to code for the body plan. But today I will uh, tell you about another research line, which is uh, about uh, microbes. So I think it's pretty impressive to think that um, in each of our bodies, uh, in, so inside and outside of each of our bodies, there are about 100 times more microbes than there are stars in the Milky Way. In particular, the gut microbial communities uh, are the most, uh, one of the most densely populated ecosystem uh, known, which makes them a very complex, which makes them very complex systems. So why? So microbial communities are important, in particular human-associated microbial communities, because they uh, have been associated with. Oh, so yeah, I wanted also to <laughs> give another number. So they are also they are important basically because they are very numerous. So that's an indication. And it has been estimated that for each human cell in the body, there is one microbe. So we are literally uh, walking microbial communities. And also uh, from a more uh, uh, pragmatic point of view, it has been uh, shown that for basically any kind of disease you can think of, from cancer to uh, obesity to even uh, depression, uh, an, uh, an association between a unhealthy gut microbiota and those diseases. So there is still many puzzles to understand the causal relationship, but the association has been already uh, observed. So from a therapy, from a, uh, so there is, yeah, obviously in the long run, we hope to have personalized medicine based on or specific uh, microbial communities of, because they, it varies among people. From a perspective, uh, terrorist, uh, terrorist, terrorist perspective, the long uh, run, the long, sorry, the long run goal in the field is to build to build uh, predictive dynamical models of those microbial communities. So the type of question we want to address with these uh, models are the following. So we want to understand how the community can be stable. So it's a big question to understand how so many uh, different microbes interacting can form a stable system. But I won't be speaking about that today. We want to understand communi community structure and I, wa I will come back to, uh, to this later. But the basic idea is that we observe in across uh, microbial communities that the composition is really dominated by rare species. So we have a few abundant species, but the majority of the, uh, po the, the communities is many different rare, sp rare species. So why don't do... Ali? We could think naively that they would die and they would be uh, uh, killed by the strongest guys, but it's not the case. We want to understand the origin of enterotypes, so very briefly. So plot doesn't show really well, but the, the idea is that if we represent in 2D uh, the uh, community composition, so if you choose wisely, you don't choose bacteria 1, bacteria 2, but you choose wisely a combination of those bacteria to, to represent this in the 2D uh, in the plane. So each dot is a different individual, and we see that there are cluster, clusters occ occurring, saying that basically people uh, belong to show different types of uh, uh, bacterial composition in the gut. And 
if you analyze this a bit in more detail, you see that these clusters they correspond to uh, different fab families of bacteria who are dominating uh, the community. So then we want eventually to gain control. So in case you have, yeah, I don't want to go to the detail of the plot, but basically if you have a unhealthy composition, what, how should we perturb the system to, to go back to a healthy state? So before uh, building models, basically we want to look at experimental data. So how do we do this? And for uh, human gut microbiota, uh, the way to go, and was done by uh, uh, Lawrence David here, which, with whom I actually shared an office at some point, but I was not working on that, unfortunately, at the time. But so what he did for a, a year, he collected these tools for one year, every day, and he sequenced them. Uh, the stool to have as a probe for the community composition of the uh, gut flora. So, for so the result is as follows. So, for visualization purposes, I represent only represented only uh, five species at random, but um, he, he, he could distinguish about hundred different species uh, uh, across that year. And what we see, basically, is a stable state with fluctuation. So the fact that there are these straight lines is just sampling artifacts, and the fact that it's a log scale, so it's not very important. But we see, basically, fluctuation around the steady state. Um, and uh, so I, uh, we, we, collect, uh, so we did a literature search, and we could find only <coughs> about uh, 12 different uh, time series of microbial communities that were taken for such a long time. But the, the communities were coming from different, uh, very dif I mean, there are very different types of microbial communities. So we have marine plankton, but we have also microbial communities coming from different body sites. And each time it looks like a uh, steady state and with fl fluctuation around. Something uh, that is also, so that's a time, the, 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 the temporal dynamics. But we can also look at a snapshot, so it's not very visible, but basically what we plot, the, the second line, is the abundance versus the rank. So the rank, we just take at one time point, we look what's the most abundant bacteria, that's rank one, second most abundant, rank two, etc. And we always see the same shape of this, uh, of this curve. And this is, uh, so it has been rescaled here, so I'm sorry for that, but if we had put relative abundance, we could see on those curves that the vast, ma vast majority of the bacteria account for less than 1% of the total composition. So this is called heavy tailed uh, rank abundance distribution, and it's not really understood uh, why we observe this. So now in the like, theoretical ecology, People use Lotka-Volterra models to build dynamical models of these microbial communities. So I will give you a crash course on Lotka-Volterra models, but in view of the audience, I, I think I can be very fast. So the idea is that you have, in a, it's uh, like in an ecosystem, you have different species. So here we have rabbit and sheep. And uh, these uh, animals, they compete for uh, the same resource, which is grass here, and we can transform that into equation so very quickly so we have r is the uh, population of rabbits so the rate of change of this rabbit the first term is a growth term so if we had only the growth term we would get exponential growth which is not realistic then you have the self interaction so the, the r square term and this is uh, representing the fact that at some point uh, the, the the resources will be limited so you, you will go to a steady state and then you can inc incorporate the effect of the, inter like the competition for the grass as also a negative term, uh, which is coming from the sheep. And then you have the same equation for the sheep, but obviously the growth rate of the rabbits is higher because they reproduce like rabbits. And uh, the interaction is more important on, on the rabbits from the sheep than reversely, because they are stronger. So le this leads to nonlinear uh, equations and typically we will need to rely on numerical simulation beque because we cannot solve that analytically. Just a tiny uh, 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 specification, so if you have just one species this would be modeled uh, with the logistic equation. 
And now we go to uh, a community with uh, 100 species. So we generalize this type of equation. And we can also include, maybe I will use this. Uh, so we can include an immigration term. Then we have the growth term, pairwise interaction between all the species. And because this is obviously influenced by uh, the environment, we have ext extrinsic noise. So this will be, so that this term here uh, is actually a noise term in the growth rate because it's linear in the growth rate. Then we have a, a here a noise term for the immigration process. And this represents uh, the intrinsic noise, which is due to the uh, discrete nature of the microbes and the fact uh, that the, the, the processes of birth and death are stochastic. So this is our basis to model microbial communities. And the question we address was, OK, everybody uses that. We have experimental data from microbial communities. Can this generalized lotka uh model describe the uh, experimental time series that I've shown you? And so to answer that question, we need to be more specific. So we need to characterize the noisy dynamics. So basically, we have, as I told, as I told you, fluctuation around the steady state. And to characterize this, we did uh, four different, we used four different characteristics. So I will go through them one by one. So the first one we consider, uh, so we can, for each, that's supposed to be one species within a community. And we consider the size of the jump between two time points. And for each species, we computed the mean value of this jump, the absolute mean value of the jump. And we reported that as a function of the mean abundance of the species in a log log plot. And what we see, so each point here corresponds to one species in the community. And we see that this fits well with a, a, a linear. So the exponent is al almost one. And we see that in all our time series for, yeah, for all, all, all the communities. So this hints at the fact that the dominant source of noise is the linear noise, which means that the, 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 uh, what is dominant in, in the, the, the uh, and the more noisy uh, thing in the system is the growth rate. And it makes sense, we eat three times a day, or that this growth term is very uh, noisy. Um, and then we reported also, we, we computed uh, the, uh, the ratio between two successive time points so that we can capture uh, the fact that it's go up or down. And, uh, we, we made an histogram of this, uh, of this, the, re the, the ratio between two successive time points. So the mean of this uh, distribution will always be one because we are around steady state. And to characterize the, str the strength of the noise, uh, we computed the, um, um, the variance of the distribution. So this ratio of the jump, they would, uh, they would fit well with a log normal distribution. And we observed that the, uh, the the width of the distribution is around one, which means basically that you do big, you do big jumps, essentially. So from these two characteristics, we concluded that, that uh, we need to use the linear noise is dominant and this noise should be large, which is not surprising, but yeah. Then the next characteristic we looked at is uh, we wanted to assess the, uh, how much temporal structure there was in the time series. And for that, uh, we computed the power uh, uh, spectral density for each um, uh, species. And we used the, the well-known fact that, okay, if you compute, so the temporal structure can be encoded by the autocorrelation. And uh, we know that the flatter the autocorrelation is at the origin, the more temporal structure there is in at your in your time series. And this uh, correlates with the fact that you get a steeper power spectrum. So we can associate, and it's kind of a, I don't know, a, a usage in the community to associate to this, the slope of the power spectrum to associate a color. So if you have a white noise, you will have uh, the uh, flat power spectrum. If you have a uh, pink noise, you will have a spectrum in 1 over s, so the slope is minus 1. Brownian dynamics, you will have a slope of minus 2. And you, we associate, this is really bad choice, because the white note is blue, the okay, pink note is pink, but the brown note is green. So, but, so we use a scale where it's white, pink, brown, and the darker, the more 
temporal structure there is in the community. Uh, and then we, 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 so for each community, so one dot is one species, and we see um, that like the slope, so the color of the noise for each species, uh, when we plot that against the mean abundance of the species, we see that there is no correlation. So this might seem like not that interesting, what, why plotting that as a function of the mean abundance if you, we don't see any, uh, any structure. But the thing is that if we now do in silico uh, time series with the GLV model, we see structure. So we see that the slope of the power spectral density correlates with the mean abundance, but not exactly. So, so it actually correlates with the mean abundance times the self-interaction. But self-interaction is something we don't have access to in the experimental data. We have access to the mean value of the species, but not the self-interaction. And this is actually due to the fact that there is a, a tradition in the field to always set the self-interaction to minus one. So if we put the self-interaction to minus one, we see that there is a destructor and it's not disturbed by the, the interaction between the slope and the mean abundance. Basically, we cannot explain what we have seen on the previous slide. So what we propose is that we need to use uh, self-interaction, which varies over order of magnitude in the lot volterra model to uh, be able to reproduce the experimental characteristics. Um, Okay, and the last uh, thing we, uh, last characteristic we used is also related to a, uh, like a broad uh, debate in uh, theoretical ecology. And the debate is, uh, is the community neutral, in a neutral, uh, I, I'm not sure how to say, like is, do we have a neutral community or a, a community which is in a niche regime? So neutral, neutral theory says that the, the driving uh, force in the ec ecosystem is stochasticity of the birth and death processes, while uh, the niche uh, theory states that the driving factor uh, in the setting the community structure is the interaction between the species. And we can test uh, for neutrality of a time series by, uh, I mean, there are several tests that exist and we have used two of them. So one is based on the, yeah, maybe it's a bit technical, so we can, maybe we can save a bit of time if I go quickly through this and I go, don't go to the detail, but I'm happy to explain if someone is interested after. So we can use something based on a kublai leibler divergence, which is basically comparing two probability distributions. And another one, which is comparing, like, w which is testing the invariance under grouping of the community. So you s if you group uh, species, like you say species one and species two, we put, we sum them together, we consider them as one group and species three, four, five, or we, like we, we change the grouping of the species. Neutral theory says that uh, the result basically should be independent of this grouping because species are not special. They are no, I mean, it's not important, the difference between the species. And basically for all, so all the time series, like we, we looked at uh, that we found in the literature. We, for the two tests, we always obtain that it's in the niche regime. So, like light stuff here, it doesn't look that good. So it's just the, the, the colors don't go well, so it's not that neat, but it's always niche. And reddish for the other tests, so it's all also a uh, niche. So, basically, uh, we propose a minimal model, which is this logistic uh, equation. So no interaction, no pairwise interaction. So the logistic equation for each species plus a uh, large linear noise. And if we do, uh, I mean, we, we do in silico time series with this model, we can study the properties and they are really comparable with what we see experimentally. Even the niche character, which could be think of being uh, a bit surprising because here we don't make any difference. So we put the same growth rate and se same self-interaction for all species. So we don't make difference between the species. But we have, uh, so I'm just a little bit lying because what's something that we have imposed at first here is the rank abundance distribution. So you can, so to, to, to determine the steady state, you can set this equal to zero. So you don't take care of the noise, so you can so we can we fix the growth rate in such a way that we observe so the steady state is given by xi is gi over omega ee 
and minus sign. But basically, we can imp we can choose the growth rate to, to impose this this the, the distribution of abundances. So that was a bit cheating, and this is sa saying that the species are not equal. So it's not surprising that we get niche even if there are no interaction between the species. So to summarize uh, this, um, all like I put here, each column is different communities and we see always the same typical behavior of these communities. Uh, and, okay, we, uh, yeah, too much text, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so basically at the observed time scale, we can reproduce all these things with a, stock, a logistic model. Um, but, um, so the, the, the message, we don't say that interactions are not important, but we say that they are not important at the observed time scale. And we were still puzzled by this. We had to impose this rank abundance distribution, which is not very natural. So we wanted to, uh, to, uh, to get that as an emergent phenomena. So that was uh, uh, like a follow-up uh, stories. And basically, so for lot Cavaldera model, it doesn't come up uh, for free, like that this rank abundance, so the dominance of the rare species. But uh, we know from uh, kind of old work that uh, these heavy tail distribution, they can come from uh, self-organization. And more recently, it, uh, some uh, uh, approaches of ecosystem that were based on individual modeling approach, uh, you get this uh, heavy tail rank abundant distribution as an emergent phenomena. So we wanted to understand precisely what was important in the individual model approach to get this heavy tail distribution. And we re realized that it was really the fact that the, uh, so you, you simulate eat microbes, so you, 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 you place the microbes on a grid basically, and then you have kind of an automaton. This is this individual modeling approach. And the fact that you get this heavy tail comes from the finite size of the grid that you place the, the, the microbes on. So we wanted to mimic this finite size of the grid on the GLV model. And this is natural in the sense that we have access only to a limited amount of resources. So this we added a maximal capacity, which is mimicking the finite size of the grid and physically representing the fact that we have a limit global limits on the resources. So we split it the term in our uh, GLV equation. So the basically the death term and the growth terms. And we multiplied all the positive term by this global maximal capacity. So when you reach the maximal number of species possible in the system, all the growth term will be suppressed. And if we now do the, the simulation of our system like this, we get for free like as an emergent feature, the fact that uh, uh, we have heavy tailed abundance distribution. So basically, uh, to obtain, uh, so to summarize, uh, to obtain a predictive dynamical model, I f the, the next step uh, is to go to more densely uh, sample uh, 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 time series and uh, to capture the interaction between the species because we know they we know that in bacteria if you do you grow them two species in the lab you know they interact uh, through the nutrients so we want we know it plays an important role but so far we don't see it in this uh, experimental data but uh, the field is like exploding and there are many experiments being done so i'm confident that we can progress a lot by having access to um, better time series and also uh, it would be very nice to have uh, uh, access to experimental data about the, the, to measure the concentration of the nutrients and to, gen to, 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 uh, to get models where the nutrients are also explicitly modeled in the, in the system and to have access to the spatial structure would be even better and yeah. So, uh, so there is a, still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. The questions for Sophie. You, you mentioned the 1972 paper by Bob May at the very, very yeah. beginning. Uh, and, yes. Right. And that was the one about how, you know, how varied can the group of oh. competing species be 
uh, this. Yeah, and still be st stable, yeah. Yeah, yeah. May 19th, I, I remember reading this years ago, and I've, I've kind of forgotten the conclusion. I, roughly speaking, it was that you can't have more species stably surviving than the available the number. Of the, the number of nutrients, basically, I think. And yeah. what has happened to that conclusion in this uh, way of looking at things? Has that disappeared entirely? Does nobody think about that anymore? Yes, yes, many people think about that problem. And um, so now I, I, I cannot reconstruct the story uh, quickly in my mind, but so it, it has been overcome. I don't remember exactly how, but the, 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 so the basic conclusion is that uh, I, th I think I have in mind that if you have um, like three nutrients and three species. I mean, you cannot have, if you have only three nutrients, you cannot have more than three species or something. I don't, I, I cannot. The conclusion. I yeah, the but. Um, fact about random matrices. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I cannot. I I, but, but I mean, in, in the uh, con considerations that you were going through here, the question of what these guys are eating, you know, how many different things they were eating uh, doesn't come in. No, because it's so the, the it's an effective model where the so the pairwise interaction are supposed to represent how these species uh, compete for the same resource. So typically, if some some microbes they can produce some nutrients for that can be helpful or deleterious for other species. So it's yeah, but I I, I really cannot. In the end, the conclusion that you reach is that you can forget about their interactions at least that they. At some scale, like at at some level, uh, we can we can model that effectively. But there are also papers showing that these pairwise interaction they cannot capture all the types of nutrients interaction. So sometimes you need to to go to higher order terms. I think so. The, the conclusion of some paper is that you cannot use GLV to describe all complicated type of nutrients interaction that there can be between the species. But I think that if you include a higher order term, not pairwise, but uh, third order or higher terms in, in the lot cavalter equation, this could be possible. But I, I've never really worked on this complexity, stability, this type of problem, but I, I know there are many people who did work on that, very recent work, but yeah, I couldn't, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think uh, in view of the time, let's yeah. thank uh, <laughs>